I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. Hebrews, chapter 5. As we get started, we're going to read verses 7 through 10. Hebrews 5, verses 7 through 10. Speaking of Christ, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, call of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is going to be part two of a sermon I began last week on the benefits of suffering. Even that phrase, the benefits of suffering, sounds like it should be self-contradicting. Uh, the word suffering implies, excuse me, physical pain, uh, injury, misery. It, it connotes sickness and sadness and heartbreak and heartache and tragedy and disease and even financial ruin. You wonder, how could anything good come out of any of that? And just as I often say, my job is not to change the Bible, the Bible's job is to change me, so the work of suffering is also intended to make you a better man or a better woman for Jesus Christ's sake. So how does a Christian, and by that I mean a true believer in Jesus, how does a Christian face times of suffering? And I mentioned three benefits that can come from suffering last week. First of all, you win a victory in the unseen world, in the invisible world between heaven and hell. That's where all the action is taking place, and that's where the battle between uh, God and the forces of Satan are after your soul or after your success as a Christian to destroy you, if at all possible. Uh, secondly, it expands your view of God. You realize how insignificant you really are alongside God. And thirdly, it keeps you humble. This is what the Apostle Paul learned through his affliction. And so let me continue with that list, and we'll just pick up where we left off last time. And so if you're writing notes, we'll start off with point number four, the fourth benefit that might come from suffering. And this might be the most important of all of them is that suffering brings closer fellowship with Jesus Christ. At least it should, if you're saved, it should bring you into closer fellowship with Jesus Christ. The text we read in Hebrews 5, verse 8, says about Christ, Though he were a son, he was the son of God, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. It's tempting, excuse me again, I'm sorry. It's tempting to ask, what did Jesus have to learn? If he was God manifest in the flesh, didn't he know everything? And the answer to that question is yes and no. For any man, and the Lord Jesus was a man, there's a difference between knowing something in theory and knowing it by experience. If you cry out to God in your times of, of distress and misery, some physical problem has come to you, some family trial or tragedy that uh, is overwhelming, and you cry out to God in desperation for help, God can't really say, I understand. I understand. I know what you're going through. If he's never gone through anything, but through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, he can say that. God can now say, I know what it's like to be mocked. I know what it's like to be slandered. I know what it's like to have my words twisted and misinterpreted. I know what it's like to be spat upon. I know what it's like to be beaten. I know what it's like to be scourged. I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be thirsty. I know what it's like to be tempted in the flesh. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, when Satan approached him in the wilderness. 
I know what it's like to have my own family members reject me, my closest friends forsake me. I know what it's like to be stripped naked and held up to public ridicule. And I know what it's like to be murdered. It was necessary for the Son of God to come into the world and be born as a man, to live among men, to walk among men, so he can identify with men. And it's in that, uh, Paul writes, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou, God, mightest be justified in thy sayings and overcome when thou art judged. Romans 3, verse 4. And it's in that context that Christ, quote, learned obedience by the things which he suffered, by willingly going through the same things that men and women go through. So through suffering, Christ can identify with you in a way that no idol, no pagan god, no deity of, of any other religion could ever do. All of those are demons and uh, unclean spirits anyway. There's only one true Lord God, and there's only one Jesus Christ. A stupid Muslim phrase, you know, um, there's only one God, but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Blessings be upon him. What a stupid thing. What a... Muhammad was a pedophile. He was an uneducated pedophile. He had something like, I don't know, 30 wives. His youngest one was six years old when he got married to her. He went to bed with her when she was nine years old. He was 30 at the time. Muhammad was an idiot. And you have to wonder about the, the mental uh, stability of someone who would follow him. But Paul prayed, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You know, the first definition of fellowship isn't, hey, we're fellowshipping over in the fellowship hall with cookies and fruit punch. That's not fellowship. Fellowship is a noun. It's something you have. It's not something you're doing. You're not fellowshipping. You either have fellowship with someone else or you don't have it. The first definition of fellowship is a bond, a union, something that knits two people together because of a, the same experience, the same uh, uh, event. Think of two veterans who were in combat side by side. Years later, they are closer together closer to each other than any other bond between any two people could possibly be because they went through something serious together. And if the Lord Jesus identified himself with you through suffering, then you identify yourself with him through suffering. If you take it patiently, if you take it patiently without losing hope, without losing confidence in God, suffering should produce greater fellowship with God. A fifth benefit that can come to the believer through suffering is this. It can prepare you for greater blessings later. Greater blessings later. Turn, if you will, to the book of Job. We were in Job last week, last time. Job is a model example of someone who suffered without losing his faith in God, without cursing God over it, and trusting God no matter what came his way. Job chapter 42. After Job had lost everything, he lost all his children, he lost his possessions, he lost his flocks, he lost his cattle, he lost his servants, and lastly, he lost his health. Sore boils from head to toe. After his so-called friends came thinking they were going to help, all they did was speculate as to what Job must have done to bring these tragedies on himself. He said to them, miserable comforters are ye all, Job 16, verse 2. Yet the story of Job and his tragedies still says, In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly, Job 1, verse 22. But notice Job 42 and verse 10. It tells us, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Evidently, his, his ten children were restored back to life again. 
Back in chapter 1, verse 3, he had 7,000 sheep. Now he ended up with 14,000 sheep. He had 3,000 camels. Now he had 6,000 camels. 500 yoke of oxen. Now he had 1,000. He had 500 she-asses. He also had 1,000 of those. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. And he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife in Egypt. And he spent years in prison. Uh, separated from his father, separated from his, all of his brothers, he still loved them, separated from his entire family. He must have been at the lowest point he could possibly be. And without expecting it, he was elevated to the second position in Egypt after Pharaoh himself. They cried, bow the knee when Joseph came by. But he had to go through suffering to get to that point. Suffering can prepare you, however, for greater blessings later on. It's just necessary to go through. It's the one thing we don't want to go through, but it's the thing that's necessary to prepare you for something greater God has in mind. And point number six, a sixth benefit that can come from suffering is this. It prepares you for miracles. Now, whenever we throw the word miracle out, people say, well, he's charismatic. No, I'm not charismatic. And uh, the charismatics don't believe what they say. It's just gibberish. It's just something they say. They were taught to say it by Oral Roberts and Catherine Kuhlman years ago, and it's repeated them by Benny Hinn. It's repeated them by you know, Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland, and all of these TBN weirdos. You know, these guys are going, and Satan, you take your hands off of God's property and let, you know, release those funds to God's case. Shut up, you know. We believe in healing. We just don't believe in healers. Think about Sarah, who was 90 years old, barren, at a time when the greatest joy of a woman was to, bring, to bear a son for her husband. And she must have resigned herself to die childless. And Abraham went in into Hagar, her handmaiden, and Hagar bore Ishmael. And uh, Ish Hagar undoubtedly was using that. Hey, I, I brought forth something for your husband that you couldn't bring forth. It won upmanship. And uh, she was suffering. In those days, that would have been great suffering for a woman. And when she was probably decided, I'm going to die without ever giving a, giving a child to Abraham, she bore Isaac. And God said, kick out Hagar, kick out Ishmael. And she said, the son of this bondwoman should not be heir with my son, uh, Isaac. But we read, my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Genesis 17, verse 21. At least one and a half million Jews, Israelites, were fleeing Egypt following Moses out of uh, Egypt and they found themselves trapped with a Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army of 600 chariots pursuing behind them. I mean, that was a desperate situation. And just at that moment, and that everything looked dire and, and bleak, God opened up the Red Sea, and the Israelites were able to pass through during the night, and a cloud blocking Pharaoh from seeing where he was going uh, they couldn't pursue after Israel. And once the cloud was lifted and Israel was safe to the other side, Pharaoh went in and God destroyed the Egyptians with the water afterwards. There in Genesis chapter 13. In 1 Kings, there was a woman and her son. And they were starving to death. They had just enough uh, meal to make uh, one last uh, meal for themselves. A meal meaning uh, baking grain. Uh, they had just enough to make one more meal, and after that, they were ready to starve. That was dire straits. That was a bad predicament. God sent a miracle by Elijah so that the barrel of meal was full and a cruise of oil uh, was full, uh, neither of which would run out from that time on. But they had to get desperate before God intervened. Daniel was falsely accused before being sent into the lion's den and miraculously delivered by God, Daniel chapter 6. 
5,000 men, as well as their women and children, had to get hungry before the Lord Jesus fed the multitude. John chapter 6. Ten men had to contract leprosy before Jesus healed them all. There in uh, Luke chapter 17. Bartimaeus was a blind man, and he undoubtedly had suffered for years before the Lord Jesus healed him. Mark chapter 10. Now, none of these examples guarantees that God is always going to heal you of your sickness or that some miraculous event will take place and change your circumstances. But unless you're willing to accept the suffering that you have uh, without complaining, without cursing God, as Job didn't do, you'll never appreciate the miracle when it comes. I confessed last week that I've got cancer. Brother Mark's had cancer. Some of you have had it. Right now, I'm going through chemotherapy every two weeks. And I was told just recently that I should probably plan on chemotherapy every two weeks for the rest of my life. Well, that's kind of discouraging, to be truthful with you. But I have friends all over this country praying for me. All of you, I know, have me on your prayer list. There's some folks who commented in last week's sermon said they're going to pray for me as well. I'll tell you what happened to me last year. About a year, a little over a year ago. In my day job, I work in the funeral business. We were conducting a funeral at a Catholic church. And after the funeral was over, I, I went back into the church to usually you know, thank the musicians and say thank you to the priest. You have to be nice to people when you're dealing with them all the time. And uh, the priest, he hadn't even changed his clothes. He was still wearing his, you know, robes from mass. He says, well, how are you doing? And I wanted to just, you know, pass it off and say, well, I'm not too bad. I'm doing pretty good. But the words, well, I've got a cancer diagnosis, and I'm not sure how to deal with it. And he said, well, let me pray for you. Give me, anoint you with oil for healing. In my mind, I'm thinking, that's last rites, isn't it? <laughs> that's usually not a good sign. And I wanted to say, no, I'm fine. But anyway, the words, sure, I'd be happy to take that, came out of my mouth. So we went back into the church. I sat on the front pew. He went and got his oil and put some on my forehead and prayed his standard prayer. Uh, the Catholic priest would pray for someone that's sick. And the entire time, I'm thinking, all right, Lord, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this? And after he got done, I, I said, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your um, gesture, your kindness. He said, no, you pray for me. He sat down on the pew, and I stood up and put my hands on his shoulders, and I prayed, you know, he's a pastor of this church. God, you know, give him wisdom and make sure he makes good decisions and so on, that kind of thing. And I prayed, God, I prayed to reveal yourself to him in a real way like you've never done before. Of course, in my mind, I was thinking salvation, right? And uh, he was thankful to me. I had a chance to tell him how I got saved as a little boy under my father's ministry. I told him how I was born again, and I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed God to forgive me. And I understood how simple it could be. It's a spiritual transaction between the sinner and the Savior. And uh, so I left. I no sooner got back to my job at the funeral home, and I got a call from him asking if I was free to meet him for lunch. I, I wasn't able to do that, but at least I gave him my testimony, and now the ball's in his court. He, he knew enough about non-Catholics and what we profess to believe in, and he knew what I was getting at. You need to be born again. So I had a Catholic priest pray for me, and I found out I was on a prayer list of another Catholic church we do business with. I didn't even ask for that one. I didn't even know who told them. And uh, people all around, I, I had a Buddhist, uh, some Buddhist nuns that I met told me they would pray for me. Of course, when you don't believe in any God, who are you praying to? You know? And I was at a Mormon church, and a Mormon bishop, uh, I, you know, I just told him that I was 
sick and he would told me about his problems. He said, well, have you had a Mormon blessing? I said, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I don't need your Mormon blessing. But I'll take as much prayer as I can get, you know. And, uh, but to lay it in God's, put it in God's court, now it's up to God to either act or say, I've got something better for you, or I'm not going to heal you because I want you to come to heaven. I, who knows what God's response may be. But uh, I'm praying, my friends are praying, and I'm just excited to see what might happen if God intervenes. I'm looking forward to that. But by suffering, it prepares you for miracles. The seventh benefit that can come from suffering is it increases your testimony for God. As if you take it patiently, if you take it faithfully, if you endure this hardship, this trial, this problem, this tragedy, this family matter, this sickness, this disease, this prognosis, medical prognosis that's bleak, whatever it is, if you endure it uh, without losing hope and confidence in God, it increases your testimony in Christ. Do you want to be effective um, in giving a testimony for Jesus Christ? Do you want to be a better, do you want to be able to plant seed or water seed uh, or see it come forth into eternal life as a soul winner from time to time? Well, one of the ways by which you can do those things is to keep serving God in the midst of your problems, in the midst of your troubles. Turn, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter 2, and look there at verses 19 and 20. Peter writes, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? And as if you do wrong, you deserve to be punished. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Charles Weigel was a Christian songwriter and an evangelist, and God was blessing his meetings back in the 1920s around the country. And uh, he was out here in California sitting on the platform before an evangelistic meeting, and they were making announcements, and he was sitting there waiting to be called to, to preach. And someone slipped up to him behind him with a telegram from his wife back in Tennessee telling him that when he comes home, she's done. She doesn't want to be a preacher's wife anymore. I'd just like to get up and preach with that note fresh in your pocket. He went through that and went back home. And uh, 1927, she said she wanted a divorce. That, that was unheard of in those days. She wanted a divorce. She, she didn't want to be an evangelist's wife. She didn't like the life he was living. And um, that heartbreak eventually produced this song, 1932. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Who knows how many people have been blessed by that song over the decades. How many sinners uh, were moved uh, to make a decision and receive Jesus Christ because of the words of that song. We'll never know till we get to heaven. But it cost him something. He had to suffer first to get there. In 1871, the great Chicago fire destroyed most of that city. There was a successful attorney named Horatio Spafford 
He was a Presbyterian. In those days, the Presbyterians actually preached the gospel. They don't preach it now. They don't know it. They're not, they wouldn't recognize it if they saw it. But they preached the gospel in those days. And uh, Mr. Spafford was wealthy and successful. He was a friend of D.L. Moody's in those days. But uh, so he had purchased a lot of property, had a lot of possessions and, and properties throughout the city of Chicago. And the fire destroyed nearly everything he had, reduced him down to just almost poverty. And uh, he had once had a, a son die at four years old from scarlet fever. And as he's trying to rebuild his life, he sent his wife and four daughters to England for a change of scenery, and he was planning to come and rejoin and join them soon later. On the way to England, the ship his family was on sank, and all four of his daughters, ages two, five, nine, and 11, died and drowned in the ocean. He got a telegram from his wife uh, once they reached, once they were rescued and got to England, saying, began with the words, saved alone. Saved alone. Children are all gone. Kind of like Job's servants came back and said, uh, I only am escaped to tell, uh, to tell thee. But Out of that tragedy, Mr. Spafford wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Oh, the modern day Job Horatio Spafford's account. I'm going to make this a little bit personal. In 1961, actually February 14th, 1961, my father's father, my grandfather Shribe, died. He was saved, went to be with the Lord in heaven. But I was born in December of 1960, just less than two months before that. We lived in California, and he lived in New York, so I never had a chance to meet him, or he never saw me. And um, I mean, my dad, I, I'm sure, was still excited that he had a son, uh, his firstborn. I mean, look at me. I mean, why, who wouldn't be proud, right? But I know I was thinking about this this morning as I was preparing for church. I know my dad's heart had to be very heavy. He and my uncle went back to New York for the funeral. My dad preached my grandfather's funeral. I know he had to feel like a great loss had come to him. And I know he probably shed a lot of tears. But after the funeral, my dad led his aunt to the Lord Jesus Christ. He led his sister, my aunt, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he had to suffer first. Suffering had to come first. before the testimony was increased. And um, he's never wavered. And my dad and I are talking about sitting down together to write a book for preachers on how to preach the very best funeral service, the most effective funeral service, something we didn't learn a lot of in uh, uh, Bible school. And my dad's preached uh, at least 3,000 funerals over the years. And I've been working in the funeral business for over 30 years. And I've witnessed at least 30,000 funerals in those years. So I, I have 
an idea of what goes on, and I know a good sermon, I know a good funeral when I hear it, and a bad one when I hear it, and my dad is one of the best speakers for funerals, especially the funeral of a believer. Those should be easy to preach, a saint of God. But two years ago, I was starting my chemotherapy, and every two weeks I go and they, they connect the, this portable pump. It's got all the cocktail in it uh, with a line to the porticath in my chest. And I walk around tethered with that for the next two days. It just runs continuously. And when the machine empties out, I go back to the clinic and let them have their uh, pump back. And about uh, a little over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I saw in the paper that a lady had died. And she used to come to church here, and her kids were friends of mine in school. Um, one of her daughters, I kind of thought she was cute. Now I was fifth grader, but she was an older woman. She was a seventh grader, so uh, nothing ever became of that. But, <laughs> but so I went to the, I went to the uh, funeral home for that viewing one evening, and I had the pump with me. I was connected to it. it was, I just put the strap over my shoulder, put my coat over it so it wouldn't be so obvious, and her, this lady had said to me sometime, in the, sometime ago, several years before, when I die someday, I want you to officiate my funeral. And I, I thought she mistook me for my father because she used to come here when my dad was the pastor. She said, no, I mean you. And uh, I never thought I would. I mean, and then when I learned that she passed, I said, well, I guess I won't do that. So when I went there, I mentioned that to her daughter and her husband, and she said, you know something, we don't have a minister for tomorrow. Would you, would you like to come preach? So I, I said, I, I would be honored. So I went home and prepared for that, went back the next day, still had the pump. I was still getting chemotherapy while I was speaking under my suit coat, and I managed to get through it. We went over to the cemetery. And we got through that. But during that funeral, I looked in the back row, and there was my dad. And I wanted to not only make him proud of me, able, uh, preaching a funeral, but um, he had known this lady, and so he attended the service. Got over to the cemetery, and we had the final conclusion part there. Then later, I was talking to... Uh, another daughter of this lady and she said you know someone in our crowd heard you say heard what you said heard you speak and they said you know he's the real deal I don't know how to respond to comments like that but I'm glad they had a good impression and I'm glad the gospel was able to go out and I'm glad people heard it I had someone come to me and ask where's your church I'd like to visit it sometime of course, people that say that very seldom ever visit. However, on occasion, someone may. But suffering should serve to increase your testimony for God. Another benefit of suffering, this is point number eight. And I want to move along here. It causes you to grow as a believer. Go quickly to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, I will confess, one of the side effects from my treatment is a dry eye. And the body keeps compensating by flooding it with, with tears. And I can't seem to get it to stop. Uh, it also has made me more emotional than I was before. And so I get teary-eyed at something that touches my heart. That, coupled with the tears, the, the constant tearing, is uh, that's why I'm always wiping my eyes. But, uh, of course, my friends at work tell me, don't cry, Mike, it's okay. You know. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. 
Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, our earthly fathers, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Sometimes your suffering or trial is, in fact, an act of chastening, an act of punishment from God. A discipline, rather. That's a better word. Uh, you thought you were being a good Christian, everything was okay, you had no problems, but God thought differently. He saw something in you that needed to be changed, needed to be corrected. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, that through suffering, quote, the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then he says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. We considered that text last week. You become a stronger Christian with God if you endure suffering patiently. Christ said in John 15, verse 2, that, quote, every branch that, bringeth, uh, that beareth fruit, he, God, purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You become a more fruitful Christian when you endure tragedy and hardship that way. And here, Hebrews 12, Paul says the chastening or the correction of God, that might, be, that might seem like suffering to you, is intended to make you, quote, partakers of his holiness. So suffering causes you to grow as a Christian. And uh, point number nine, a ninth benefit that can come from suffering is this. It reminds you that this isn't heaven. You'd think it'd be self-evident, right? It'd be obvious. The word obvious means standing, literally means standing in the way. You trip over it if you're not careful. That's the ultimate definition of the word obvious. But um, it reminds you that this isn't heaven. Back in Genesis chapter 3, and you don't need to turn for time's sake, Verses 17 to 19, we read, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. There's a curse on the ground as a consequence of Adam's sin. And there's no treatment of medical science that can make you to live forever. This world stinks. You know that? Uh, Dennis Prager likes to say, the world is a beautiful place. It's people who stink. <laughs> well, Dennis Prager, I like him, but he's not saved. So he's only half right. There's a curse on the ground. And uh, the conditions of this earth stink as well. Every time you're sick, every time you are financially broke and not sure where you're going to get the money for the next bill, uh, every time you are abused by someone, you see a funeral procession going down the street, you should remember this isn't heaven. This isn't heaven. We sing, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We sing... Uh, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus, right? Amen. Life's trials will soon be o'er. The reason unbelievers, the reason cult members, the reason politicians, carnal Christians, worldly Christians are so obsessed with fixing this world and solving this world's problems and making this world a peace on earth and transforming it in some sort of utopia is because this is all they've got. This is all they know. They don't know anything about eternal life. They've never been born again. They don't have any hope beyond this life. They can't, they are myopic. They can't see uh, beyond themselves, their conditions now, the circumstances now. They're more worried about the next congressional election. They're more worried about the next presidential election. They're more worried about who's going to get on the Supreme Court. Listen, as an American, you ought to be concerned about those things. But inside, you ought to be praying, God, come now. Lord Jesus, come quickly. But the, only, the reason they're obsessed with those things is because this is all they have. They don't know anything else. Without a knowledge of Jesus Christ, without salvation, without the comfort of the pure word of God, they have no hope. And for the believer, the hope of heaven should be more glorious uh, to you. Every time you endure tragedy, every time you endure 
some form of suffering, some sort of misery, some physical sickness, some hospitalization, some surgery, some pain, some loved one who dies, some loved one who's sick, some dear friend of yours who's hurt in a violent accident. You wonder, why? Why did it have to happen to them? Now, there's a jerk going down the road at 80 miles an hour in a school zone. Why can't it happen to him, right? <laughs> why does it happen to happen to, to someone I care about, someone I love? And your heart breaks because you are close to them. But nothing else, suffering should remind you that this isn't heaven. The Bible says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. All right, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion, and there's, there's going to have to be a part three next week because there's many more benefits that can come through suffering, and I hope to lay those out for you. But for time's sake, let's bow in prayer and conclude.